Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Temple Institute Parsha class. My name is Gedalia Meyer, and I'm podcasting from Mala Dumim in Israel. There are few things in life more frustrating than the experience of giving up. It is just so humiliating and so debilitating that it is almost beyond description. We have been trained to believe that we can do whatever it is we set out to do. Finding out that this is simply not the case, although a common enough occurrence, is too much for our fragile egos to handle. This is quite amazing if we think about it. Giving up in one form or another is probably a daily event for most of us. We realize that whatever we are doing is impossible for us, and we throw in the towel. What could be simpler? For many, getting used to this experience is part of the maturation process. Recognizing that some things are beyond us is one of the great lessons in life. When we realize this and understand that we have hit that point, we wisely make the decision to give up. But we all know that things frequently aren't so simple. There may be repercussions for this drastic but necessary act. We may have to deal with those around us who, t- who will take us to task for why we couldn't go the distance when they, of course, would have done so. This can be highly troublesome, especially if we sense that we really didn't give it all that we had. There is nothing like guilt to make an otherwise good day lousy. But on top of that, we certainly have to deal with ourselves. We are our own worst critics. And regardless of hearing from someone else that it's okay to give up, we know that it isn't. On most things, however, we learn to overcome these pangs of guilt and get on with ourselves. Again, this is part of the process of becoming mature. A good deal of that is realizing our own limitations and learning to live with ourselves when we fall short of whatever expectations we may have had. But there is no question that there are certain things that giving up on will eat us alive. We find that we cannot forgive ourselves and choose to carry this very personal and very imaginary burden around like a weight around the neck. This is where giving up becomes nothing less than a curse. We castigate ourselves to no end for the crime of not being everything we could have been and instead are simply who we are. Not surprisingly, this experience has probably been with the human race as long as they could be called human It is unclear what happens with animals when they hit this sort of wall. It is equally unclear what our more primitive ancestors, who presumably lacked the ability to get down on themselves, did with it. But human beings, in their great wisdom and intelligence, have learned to reap this feeling as a reward for setting out to do something and not succeeding. Throughout history, this has been one of the signature experiences of our species. The only way out of it is either to be superhuman or to not have any true confidence or pride in our own abilities. Also not surprisingly, the Bible has its share of these personal flops. Some may imagine that everyone in the Bible stood up to whatever challenges come their way, but anybody who has actually read the thing knows that this is certainly not the case. From Adam and Eve to Cain to Jacob to King David, we see illustrious figures falling flat on their faces again and again. Even someone as great as Moshe had to taste the bitter taste of giving up. This week's Parsha is called Bahalotcha. It's a long word that seems like it should mean more than it does. It means when you raise up or something along those lines. It refers to the procedure of when Aaron, the high priest, would light the seven branch candelabra in the Mishkan. The, the process of lighting the wicks in the candles is referred to as raising up, since the flames do go up from the wicks. It is a bit of an odd way to des- of describing lighting candles, but it has nevertheless be- become enshrined as the name of one of the most action-packed parshas in the Torah. It begins with various instructions for installing the Levites in their roles as the servants of the Kohanim in the functioning of the Mishkan. The Levites would serve from the age of 25 until they turned 50. They were essentially the workers who would keep this central shrine in order. The Mishkan was so important to the ancient Israelite society that an entire tribe was dedicated to its functioning. Next, we have the first and only celebration of Passover during the 40 years of journeying through the wilderness. This was one year after the Exodus, and it is really the, the, the first national event after the Exodus. The truly interesting thing about this event is that some people were unable to bring the Passover offering because they were ritually impure. They insisted that they also be allowed to participate in this important celebration. As a result, a second celebration of Passover was created one month after the first to enable those who couldn't participate earlier to bring a makeup offering. 
After this is a detailed description of how the actual journeys from one place in the wilderness to another would take place. There was to be trumpet blowing to initiate and end the various stages of the journeys. There was also a specific order of the various tribes marching so that the journeys themselves were orderly and not chaotic. The Ark of the Covenant, the focal point of the Israelite religious identity, would set out ahead of the entire assembly and somehow choose which place to encamp at the end of the journey. Following this, we get to the narrative events of the Parsha. The main storyline in this Parsha is complaints. The central complaint concerns a craving for meat. The people recall how good they had it in Egypt with an assortment of vegetables available to eat, whereas out in the desert they had only had the manna. They look back with nostalgia upon the normalcy of their former lives in comparison to the miraculous but highly unusual nature of their current situation. Moshe has no idea how to handle this complaint. He himself complained to God that this was all too much for him. Where was he to get enough meat to feed this massive population of wanderers? At this point, God intervenes and tells Moshe that the meat would be provided, but that it would be anything but a blessing. Because they demanded this meat in such an ungrateful manner, they would have so much that they would grow sick of eating it. It would last for a full month until it, become, it would be coming out of their nostrils and become nauseating. Then in the course of some mysterious spreading of prophetic spirit, among 70 elders of the Israelites, a wind comes and sweeps in a vast amount of quail that ends up in piles all around the encampment. In the course of eating this quail, the people began to die. It seems that a plague accompanied the, the quail, and this was the punishment for the totally inappropriate complaints about the lack of meat. The place where this happened was called Graves of Craving, an ominous name to commemorate an ominous event. The final event of the Parsha is a strange incident involving Miriam and Aaron, the sister and brother of Moshe, concerning Moshe's wife. They didn't like the fact that his wife was Ethiopian and somehow linked this to his exclusive control over prophetic interaction with God. This little incident is resolved when God criticizes them for their lack of appreciation for Moshe's unique role as a prophet. Miriam is singled out for punishment for this lack of respect and is subject to some sort of leprous infection, which delays the next journey for seven days. One of the more interesting things about all this is that Moshe uncharacteristically couldn't deal with this complaint about the lack of meat. His reaction to the complaint was to issue his own complaint to God about his role in the Exodus. Quote, where am I to get enough meat for all these people when they cry to me to give them meat to eat? I alone cannot be responsible for these people. It is too much for me. If you are going to do this to me, do me the favor of killing me so that I do not witness myself in such a terrible state. Even when God tells him that the meat will somehow be provided, Moshe doubts that it will happen. He openly wonders about God's ability to pull off this unlikely miracle. This was the man who guided the entire Exodus and organized the giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. Here he is one year later, essentially throwing in the towel over a complaint about a lack of meat. What could account for this? While it is true that he had to deal with all sorts of demands and problems over the past year and more, why did he give up at this point? To his credit, he did recover after this incident, and his status as the preeminent prophet of the Israelites was forever fixed. But this temporary failure is difficult to explain. Why couldn't he stick through this latest series of complaints like he did several times in the past? The answer, perhaps, is that we all have limitations. Everyone reaches a point in life where they feel that things are beyond their power to accomplish. Moshe reached his limit right here. It was meat, of all things, that was his red line. He gave up when it came to me, even though he was able to handle earlier issues of food, water, war, and rebellion. There is no solid reason why it was this problem that put him at the end of his tether. Perhaps it was simply the accumulation of everything that drove him to despair over his own perceived inadequacy to deal with this situation. This was just too much, and he didn't see a way out. He gave up. Perhaps there is a silver lining to all this. It is true that Moshe essentially threw up his hands over this matter, but that may tell us that even he was forced to recognize that not everything is in our hands to accomplish. We all reach that point when we realize that we are powerless in the face of reality. 
Giving up, whether warranted or not, is a way of coming to terms with our own powerlessness. It may be humiliating and it may be debilitating, but it is also humbling. Sometimes we have to look ourselves in the eye and realize that we are not God. Shabbat Shalom.